Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate you coming out tonight. How many came for business for the king? The king of kings and lord of lords. He didn't really need us. He had the angels to dispatch, take care of all the details. But he incorporated us, and he said, According to your faith, be it unto you, and we have urgent needs tonight. Brother Lowell's two brothers needs our prayer, and also Sister Brinkle is uh, needing prayer as well. Jason Jones is uh, in Afghanistan. want to pray for him. And Roxy Meeks for cancer. Doris Lewis, want to pray for her. And Deborah Lashley, also Brother Long's nephew who's burned over his entire body. Pray for him, and he needs salvation. Certainly, the Lord can speak to his heart in this vulnerable condition. Also, for Brother Teeter, Daryl Teeter's wife, uh, we need to pray for her tonight. Sister Jessie Leathers also needs prayer. She has sores on her feet. And uh, Troy Jones, who will be going into the hospital. Also, Jane Cunningham for surgery this coming Friday. Also, uh, James Williams passed away. As I understand, he attended here at this church at one time, back on the hill over here in college. Uh, here, all right, that was before our time. And he was a piano player, I understand. His wife was. Okay, these uh, fragments, we'll get them all together. And, but he went to be with Jesus, and we want to lift his family up before the Lord that God will fill that void in their heart. I wonder if I could just uh, look and scan across the auditorium if you've got a need you'd like to make that need known before the Lord in an uh, anonymous way. He, he knows every particular detail, and he's mindful of that even before we ask it. Would you stand with us and agree together upon the authority of God's Word? I thank you, Lord, that you've been touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And Lord, even before we hear the rima of the Word tonight, let faith arise. Lord, let us be able to look past the circumstances as we come together with lips of praise. We give you all the exhortation, Lord, of the honor. Uh, Master, by your stripes we proclaim every promise that's provided for us in the Holy Word of God. I trust you, Lord. You'll look down from heaven. Dispatch angels tonight, Lord, to undergird. I pray for this family that lost this dear dad. Lord, we ask you, in the name of Jesus, to undergird the family, Lord, tonight and let them become conscientious of a heaven to go to and a hell to shun. Lord, I thank you that you remind us by sickness and infirmity and crisis, Lord, that you're still the God that's able to reach down and to save and feel and heal and thrill. Lord, just wrap your arms around us tonight as we call upon you, knowing, God, that you hear and are moved with compassion. We thank you in advance, Lord, and we give you the praise in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said amen. amen. Would you amen. sing this song and worship God with us as we enter into his house with thanksgiving. And we have come into this house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into this house, gathered in his name worship him we have come into this house gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord worship him Christ the Lord so forget about yourself Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship Him. Well, as 
As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. Leads me safely to the singing sand, it is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day that I need do the best I can. For I need the light to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. Oh, I need thee every hour. Through this land, this pilgrim land, protect me by thy power. Hear my feeble plea. Oh, Lord, look down on me. When I kneel in prayer, I hope to meet you there. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Let me travel in the light divine that I may see the blessed way. Keep me that I may be holy thine and sing redemption songs someday. Brave and true, and ever firmly take a stand. As I onward go, daily the foe, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Yes, I need every hour. Through this land, this pilgrim land, protect me by thy power. Oh, Lord, look down on me. When I kneel in prayer, I hope to meet you there. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. When I wander through the valley, dim toward the setting of the sun, lead me safely to the Rested by a crown of life have won. I have put my faith in thee, dear Lord, that I may reach the golden strand. There's no other friend on whom I can depend. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. To see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. Well, on the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Here's all past home at last, ever to rejoice. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow. Many arrows pierce my soul from without within. But my Lord leads me on through if I must win. And oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. Well, on the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Here's all past home at last, ever to rejoice. When before me billows rise from the mighty deep. Then the Lord directs my bark, he does safely keep, and he leads me gently on through this world below. Well, he's a real friend to me, oh, I love him so, and oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace, on the streets of glory, let live my voice. Here's all past home at last, ever to rejoice. And oh, I want to see him look upon his face. 
there to see forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice here's old past home at last ever to rejoice amen well the only announcement is this coming wednesday night we're rehearsing for the marriage supper of the lamb i believe it's going to be sandwiches everybody needs to be there to participate or bob is going to eat too much help us out peanut butter you? and bologna sandwiches here's right here. okay sign me up if you don't have spam I mean, you know, blown is acceptable. Okay, Brother Larry, let's take up an offering. And I'm believing that rain is moving this way. Yes, I am. And it can rain for hours. I don't care. Lord, please let it rain. Father, we just thank you so much for another opportunity to come together in your name and to meet with like believers, to unite our praise together to bring glory to you. Ask God that you bless this offering in a very special way. And we praise you for it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. What God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. For his name is wonderful, 
for he's the great shepherd. He's the rock of all ages. Almighty God is he. Bow down before him. Love and adore him. His name is wonderful. Jesus my Lord. For he Lord, yes, He is Lord, and He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Will every knee shout out every time? is Lord, for He is Lord. Yes, He is Lord, for He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every say amen to that amen. amen well glory glory i just feel like somebody out here has a testimony as we make a transition but just before brother walls preaches the book of revelation i wish that that crowd on sunday morning was here to comprehend some of this coming on on a sunday night pam you're going to be blessed tonight but you can go back to the World Wide Web and you can check it out if you missed any of these services. It's going to be good. But we've asked Brother Walls, rather than uh, the following format on a Sunday night on the PM, the 2nd and the 4th, we're going to kind of flip it just a little bit and I'll take the long service. I promise I'm going to cover it with you. I'll get you out by 12. That's the deal, Lucille. Uh, but we won't hold Brother Walls to that because it's some good stuff and I hope that there'll be people be able to sample what he's been doing, uh, Brother Long, on a Sunday night that some folk missing out on it unless they go back to the World Wide Web and check it out. Hallelujah. Brother Dan's here tonight. I know he's prayed up because he's praying for mother-in-law and uh, she's got a problem with her feet and we just agree in the name of Jesus. Has God ever done anything to hear and answer prayer for you? Give us a word of testimony, would you? Well, first of all, there's, when I was in Korea... I had back surgery when I uh, ruptured the disc working on airplanes and I was laying there and I didn't know what in the world was going to happen to me because the airplanes that I worked on were uh, pretty low to the ground and it'd be really hard on my back. But uh, he, you know, and that was a critical time too because I was in Korea and Joy's uh, back here and so there was a lot of uncertainty and everything but he brought us through that not too long ago he brought me through uh, when the doctor said in his uh, prognosis that I really uh, it was not going to be able to see very well in my left eye and he has taken care of that you know and this thing about the trial you know that's been making the news you know I'd look back at my life and I was just a teenager just all about sports and a good time I had good parents and and they they loved me but I you know before I knew the Lord you know I, I had I, I drank you know and I could have ended up just in hell I you know I uh, but God turned me around when I was in the Air Force. 
Uh, I thought about it today. I, I look back a lot on my life. You know, I can see mistakes every day. I can see how short the shortcomings in my life. But I was thinking either today or yesterday how it was a mercy of God that I was before the wing commander at a base in, Dave, at, in Arizona where I did not want to work on the flight line anymore and I had gone to the first sergeant, the commander, first sergeant, all the way up to the wing commander and he could have just wrote the papers out the separation papers but he didn't and he talked to me like a father and it just turned my life around when I accepted the Lord through a roommate that was just like me but uh, I could go on and on but there's just so many things in my life when I look back and he is Lord uh there's a lot of times when I, in the morning when I'm able to have my devotions, I just try and just realize this. We're, we're not just talking about, uh, well, we're, we're talking about the master of the universe. We, we can't even understand the stars and the moon and all this stuff, but he was in on every bit of it. And, you know, we put him so low when he is the king of kings and the lord of lords and the master of the universe and i and i won't say any more but he is good to me and i'm i'm thankful that's a, just thankful to know his name because i could have walked out of this life and, and not known that i had such an opportunity to know him amen Anybody else over here got a burning testimony right in your heart? Uh, all right, and then I think your wife is up second here. You're going to you're going to share about the cow? Okay, then I can. Uh, I I shared this in Sunday school just for a minute. You know, Jesus says there's only two commandments: you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like unto it: you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But who is a neighbor? Who is a neighbor? Well. Uh, we found out what a neighbor is uh, yesterday, last night actually. Uh, it was pleasant by the time we got home. We'd met Ms. Pat in town for supper, and, uh, and it was about, oh, dark 30 when we started home. It wasn't quite dark, but it was real pleasant, about 70 degrees, and I, and I got the Kawasaki mule out of the barn, ran by the house. I called her up, and I said, come on, we need to go for a ride. And we drove down to the back of the property, and uh, right across our property fence, we saw a cow laying down with this calf right in front of it. The calf wasn't moving, and the cow wasn't getting up. She just had that calf. And, and we just knew that cow was dying. We thought the calf was dead, and that cow was dying. And we don't know who owns that property behind us. We, we haven't, we, it's not the people that live behind us. Somebody else owns those cattle and does the the hay and everything. We didn't know who it was, so we called someone that we know who had just done our hay for us, and he lives across the street and down about a quarter of a mile. And uh, I called Buck, and I explained the situation. Or Diane called him and explained the situation, and uh, and he said, I don't know who who, uh, who has those cattle, but I'll talk to Gail and see if she does his wife. And uh, And... We didn't think anything more about it. About an hour later, uh, I hear his four-wheeler pulling up in front of my house and a knock at his door, at my door. And I opened it up, and he said, Bob, tell me where those ca that cow is. I couldn't find who owns that property, and I need to go down and check on it. That's a neighbor. That's a neighbor. He was going to go down and see if that cow was in some kind of distress. And so I, I said, hang on, I'll throw some shoes on, I'll go with you. So I got on the back of his four-wheeler with him. And we went all the way down to the back again. And there that cow was standing up and that calf laying there, turned his head around and looked at us. And, uh, and everything was okay. But a neighbor, a neighbor, that's somebody who will stop what they're doing and go do something for somebody that they don't know. And I certainly didn't know what to do with that cow or that calf. I, I, I can barbecue them and eat them, but I, can't, but I, but I don't know anything else. Well, I don't know what to do either, but it didn't look right. And I went back and checked this afternoon, and, and 
I saw the cow and the calf off in the distance, and they were okay. That made me feel better. The Lord gave me this scripture just a little while ago, and uh, uh, started out with what Dan was saying, you know, the things, some things we forget. But in Isaiah 50, uh, 43, 18 and 19, it says, do not, remember, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now, now it shall be forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Amen. With him all things are possible. Glory to God. Well, I'm excited about the book of Revelation. We are living in that day, and I just can't wait for some of these other events that John the Revelator saw come to pass in the time of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Have you enjoyed the messages that Brother Walls has preached? Let's make him feel welcome as he comes to speak to us tonight. I'll get you a big bottle of water in case you get long-winded tonight, brother. All right. Praise God. Oh, Lori is going to sing. No, no, she's not. Yeah, yeah, okay. Threw me a curve. <laughs> God bless you, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Brother Charlie said I should give Sister Patsy a test after the message tonight. So uh, how many more would like to get in on this test? <clears throat> I told them that 30 minutes after I finish, I might not be able to pass it. <laughs> but anyway, how good the Lord is tonight. Praise God. I have thoroughly enjoyed doing uh, these studies for the last, what, <laughs> probably two years nearly at this point. We've just been moving kind of slowly, but... Um, after all, well, at certain points, we, uh, we felt that we needed to devote more than one message to, uh, to a chapter, and we've done that. But uh, in recent um, months, we have tried to cover an entire chapter so as not to bore you completely to death. But anyway, tonight we're going to do our best to cover chapter 20 of Revelation. And uh, there, there are only two more chapters remaining. And Pastor has asked me to uh, do these on the second and fourth Sunday mornings. Or the fourth and second. I believe that's the way it'll work out. The fourth and second Sundays fourth Sunday of July and the second Sunday of August. So um, we'll be looking forward to ministering to more of our people on a Sunday morning. And uh, my wife asked me tonight if I was going to preach to um, a few people. I said, I'll preach if there's three people here. And I said, I'll preach as if there were a thousand. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because I remember reading a story of a young preacher who uh, was supposed to preach at a meeting and he thought there would be a big crowd. But when he got there, there were just a few people. And so he quickly looked through his notes and found another sermon because he had spent a lot of time on the message he was going to preach to the big crowd. But... Um, he got up to preach, and he really bombed. And I know what that feels like. There have been not just a few, but there have been some times in uh, nearly 60 years that I've bombed a few times. But anyway, he bombed, and uh, the Lord began to speak to him and uh, showed him that if he could not preach with all of his heart to a few people, then he was not worthy to preach to a larger crowd. I've preached to big crowds, and I've preached to little crowds. I just love to preach. These uh, studies, of course, have slowed me down considerably. I mean, you, you can't really preach some of these. You have to teach, and you have to kind of move a little slowly uh, in order to um, gather up the... Uh, 
uh, pertinent points and try to get them across. But um, anyway, I'm going to do my best to do both tonight, the Lord willing. Praise God. All right, let's look into chapter 20. Do a little uh, bit of uh, uh, reminiscing or looking back across or summarizing, if you please. The seven seals have been broken from the book or the scroll that the Lord Jesus took out of the hands of the Father God. The uh, seven trumpets, the seven angels have sounded their trumpets. And the seven vials of the wrath of God or the bowls of the wrath of God have been poured out. The armies of the world that gathered to gather against Jerusalem and ultimately against the Lord Jesus Christ himself who was descending from the heavens. You know, I have to stop and ask myself, how foolish can carnal man be to assume that he would be able, even with the vast armies of the world, to confront the glorified Christ and the saints of God that are accompanying him. And, I've, and he said he would come with all his holy angels as well. And we know that heaven has an army of fighting angels. Who would dare to confront or oppose the coming Christ as he descends out of the heavens? I tell you what, ground-to-air missiles don't work here. No cannon is big enough to even affect the approaching army from out of the, the uh, glories of heaven. But these armies have been demolished. They have been all destroyed. And the Word of God tells us in our last chapter that the Antichrist and the false prophet were captured alive and cast alive into the lake of fire. Now, we're coming to the grand finale here. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Son of David, is about to make his enemies his footstool. That's what we read in, this, in the second psalm. And the, the Lord God, the Father, says to his Son, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now the son of David, the king of kings and lord of lords, is about to make his enemies his footstool and ascend the throne which the Father has promised to him. We are about to enter the kingdom age in our chapter tonight. Praise be to God. The first thing we see is what John saw. I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up. <laughs> Don't you wish a lot of times the Lord would shut him up? <laughs> Praise God. And set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, until the thousand years shall be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed. Notice the wording there. After that, after the thousand years have been fulfilled, he must be loosed a little season. And we'll get to the reason why and why he must uh, in just a little bit. This angel has a key and he has a great chain. These are literal objects and yet they're not material because we're dealing with Satan here, an evil spirit being. And this angel that is approaching, you know, <coughs> someone made the statement this morning, maybe a pastor did, that, um, that uh, some angels were stronger than others and, and some were not a match uh, for the 
enemy. And one case in point was in Daniel when uh, the, the angel Gabriel told Daniel the reason why he was delayed. He said he, he encountered the prince of Persia. And the prince of Persia withstood him, which means he opposed him. And Gabriel was not able to break through. But, <coughs> excuse me, he tells us, the word tells us that Michael came to help him. And you know who Michael is. He is that big super angel who leads the Lord's armies. He's the Lord's commander in chief of the angelic hosts. Praise be to God. So we see that Satan, Satan is the strongest of the evil spirits because he is the ruler, the prince of the power of the air. <coughs> but let me tell you something. This angel that is coming down not only has a chain, not only has a key, but he has the authority of God Almighty. And you know, when one goes in the authority of his name, one has more power than all of the combined hosts of hell. For the word says, greater is he that is in you. Thank you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Praise God. You know, sometimes uh, the devil tricks us into believing that he's stronger than we are. And that's the truth. He is. Sometimes he tricks us into believing that, will he, that we are at his mercy. But we need to remember that scripture. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Excuse me just a moment. <clears throat> My throat's a little scratchy tonight. Praise God. So this angel is authorized by the one who sits on the throne. And you know, <clears throat> the one who authorized him is the one of whom the word says, He openeth, and no man shutteth. And he shutteth, and no man openeth. Praise God. If God shuts the door, that door is shut. You remember when Noah built the ark? There came a day when God told him to go in. And then it said, it didn't say Noah shut the door, it said God shut the door. There was absolutely no way for any power, any force, or the combined uh, human population could open the door. We have, we have a couple of, of uh, examples in the Word of God where the Lord uh, opened something. Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and uh, he was uh, teaching. And the Bible says in Mark chapter 3 that there was a man with a withered hand. And he, he, uh, it was impossible for this man to use that hand, or probably even to stretch it out any. But Jesus saw him, and he said to the man, Come up here. The man came up, and Jesus said, Jesus told him to do something that was impossible for him to do. Stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it forth, and it became whole as the other one. That's the Lord opening. Praise be to God. You know, the Pharisees and other grumblers tried to shut that down before it happened. They watched Jesus to see if he would heal on the Sabbath day. But Jesus opened that bondage that Satan had laid upon that man, and praise be to God, nothing could shut it down. Let's look at one where God shut it down, and no man could open. Jeroboam was the evil king of Israel, and he had made two altars and put them in different locations be to make it convenient for the people to bring their sacrifices, and he said, don't go to Jerusalem. You don't have to go back down there. Offer them here. And Jeroboam himself, though not a priest, was about to offer incense on an altar. <coughs> and God said to his prophet, go and curse that altar. And he did. 
Jeroboam was upset. The prophet said, God is going to destroy this thing and uh, dump the ashes on the ground and so on and so forth. And Jeroboam said, lay hold upon him. And he reached out his hand and immediately that hand dried up. And he was not able to pull it in. He was in a desperate situation. He had to appeal to God. The prophet prayed for him, and he was uh, healed, restored to normal health. God can shut, and no man can open, and God can open, and no man can shut. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Well, the Word tells us that the angel bound this devil, this Satan, and threw him into the bottomless pit. Praise be to God. I'm looking forward to the day when that happens. Amen. There are previous references in the Word. In fact, we've come across them in our study in Revelation. In Revelation 9, the angel there opens the bottomless pit, and, and locusts come forth and torment men for five months. Then in 11 and 17, chapters 11 and chapter 17, this is where the beast ascends from. This, evidently, the Antichrist, as we've spoken before, suffers a mortal wound, is killed before he becomes or is recognized as the Antichrist, and he is in the bottomless pit until the time that God intends for him to be revealed. And when he comes forth, the Word says that he ascends out of the bottomless pit and returns to life, and the world wonders after him and embraces him as their God. While Satan has great power, I want you to know that it's limited. Praise God, it's limited. And while his influence is worldwide, the reason it is is because he has legions and legions of demons, a very, very, very hierarchy of evil angelic hosts that do his bidding across the planet. You know, I, every once in a while I think, I think he has some little demons that their assignment is just to harass Christians. <laughs> just, you know, those little harassments that happen in your life. We need to stop thinking in terms of people causing that. Look beyond them and realize the uh, evil influence that is behind those. Praise God. As I said a while ago, Gabriel needed Michael's help in battling the prince of Persia, but this mighty angel has no trouble putting that chain on the devil and throwing him into the pit. The Word says that the Satan was bound for a thousand years. Notice in verse 3, let's go back there and look at that. In verse 3, there, there are three different things, particularly that happens that we'd like to mention. Cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him. A seal upon him. What's the purpose for that? Well, let me tell you this. When God saved you, he sealed you. Praise the Lord. What is that seal all about? Well, number one, it is the sign of to whom you belong. To whom do you belong tonight? Well, the seal is there. Um, you say, well, I don't see a seal on Brother David's forehead. God does. Here's what the book says. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Praise the Lord. And there's a little trailer that comes along that says, And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Praise the Lord. The Lord knows them that are his. But then, this is God's seal, and there is only one way that that seal to the bottomless pit can be broken. And that's by the one who put it there in the first place. Praise be to God. I'm glad that when the devil is bound for a thousand years, 
we'll have no tempter then. Hallelujah. Can you imagine a world where Satan's absent? Where there is righteousness and peace, everybody gets along, and uh, there is prosperity, and just everywhere you look, it's beauty and goodness and prosperity. There's coming a day, praise the Lord, when that'll happen. The Bible says that he should deceive the nations no more. Amen. Then, John tells us something else. Let's look beyond this hideous being. John sees something else. He said, and I saw thrones, and, and they sat upon them. Who are they? Well, we've, uh, we've used this graphic before when we talked about the 24 elders. And we said that we believe that the 24 elders represents the raptured, glorified saints, or the church, the raptured church. And you will notice that they are sitting on thrones, raptured, glorified, and not only the raptured church uh, be prior to the tribulation, but also the, those who have uh, uh, endured the tribulation period and who have died because they insisted upon taking a stand against the Antichrist, refusing to bow, refusing to take his mark, refusing to conform to his demands. Praise be to God. You know, they are authorized to rule on the earth. They and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ are authorized to rule upon the earth. There are several scriptures that uh, mention that. Twice it's mentioned in the passage that we just read. Read, I saw thrones, they sat upon them. Judgment was given unto them. That means they were given authority. They were given a rulership. Not only to rule, but also to judge. And then the last phrase, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That is the future of those who are faithful and true to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. It says, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. I know that this is when the Lamb takes the book from the hand of Father God, but I wanted to project this to read that last phrase, and we shall reign on the earth. Do you feel like a king tonight? Do you feel like a ruler tonight? Praise God forevermore. We shall reign on the earth. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And then in, the, in verse 3 of that same chapter, know ye not that we shall judge angels? That's that's a, that's a solemn thought, if you please. We, the saints shall judge the world, and the saints shall judge angels even. Why would saints judge angels? Well, it's not the angels that were faithful, but it's the ones who followed the devil when he, or Lucifer when he rebelled against God and against the lordship of God. The devil took a, at least a third of the angelic host with him in the rebellion. And the saints uh, evidently will be authorized to judge these who, though they dwelt in the presence of the eternal, the holy, the altogether good, the truth, even though they did and had every opportunity and blessing to abide in the glory of God, they rebelled against him. And saints, how would they be authorized? How would they be worthy to judge these angels? Because, well, we fell through Adam's sin. But God sent his Son to the world. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us unto himself, a peculiar or a special people, 
hallelujah, uh, uh, who perform good works. We have obeyed the Lord, and we are living a life of obedience to God. And when we come before Him, and He, uh, he, he uh, blesses us by exalting us to a place of rulership with Him, we will judge these angels because we have been obedient and they have been disobedient. That um, may not be a, a, an important point to some, but I think that that's quite awesome. The duration of that reign is a thousand years. One thousand years. I believe that to be a literal one thousand years. And uh, the conditions that will prevail during that particular time uh, some of it is seen in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Since I think there's so much information, important information in that passage, let's just read it. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house. Let me stop here to say that we have in past studies learned that when the word speaks of a mountain, it is generally in reference to a kingdom. Let me give you an example, and I think it relates to, ex to this particular passage of Scripture. Daniel, in his, uh, or rather Nebuchadnezzar, in his dream, saw this great image with the head of gold, the arms and breast of silver, uh, the uh, abdomen of uh, brass, bronze, whatever, the, uh, and the thighs, and the legs and, and uh, feet were of iron, the feet of iron mixed with clay, which represents the total tenure of, war, of Gentile world domination. From the time of Nebuchadnezzar until the uh, kingdom that it will come into existence under the leadership of the Antichrist, that represents the total tenure of, the, of Gentile world domination. Let me announce something to you tonight. There will come a day when Israel will become the head of the nations. God said he would make them the head and not the tail. Some people quote that in reference to believers. Of course, we are in Christ. Praise the Lord. We are the head. We are a part of the head and not the tail, and we don't need to take last place. We are not to be puffed up with pride. We are to humbly glorify God that he has blessed us by making us a part of the great eternal head. But anyway, Daniel, in interpreting that dream, said to Nebuchadnezzar, you are that head, and he went on to describe the succeeding kingdoms that would become more inferior as they progress downward. But then, ne uh, then Nebuchadnezzar said that he saw a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it struck the image in its feet, broke it to pieces, it was ground to powder, and the winds blew it away. But then Daniel said, the stone grew into a great mountain that filled the entire earth. And that comes to pass when there is a voice that shouts out, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ will cover the entire world. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right. Mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, exalted above all the other, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he'll teach us of his ways, that we'll walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares 
and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is talking about the millennium, the millennial reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ will be the supreme ruler over all of the nations of the world, and his headquarters will be in Jerusalem. As Isaiah chapter 2 and verse uh, 1 through 4 uh, points out. In Zechariah chapter 14, and I've referred to this more than one time before, Zechariah chapter 4, is a, it is implied there, or rather it is uh, stated in so many words that the temple, of course, will have been restored, but sacrifice, at least in some measure, will be restored. And, of course, the temple will be in Jerusalem, and the nations will be required to come up at certain times and worship the king and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. That, in particular, is the one sacrifice that will be reinstated. And as we read it in Isaiah chapter 2 here, it says, uh, Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And the nations of the world will be affected by it. Let me stop here just to kind of mention something. <clears throat> Not everybody is going to be destroyed when Jesus comes the second time with the armies of heaven. The armies that come against him will be demolished. The Antichrist, the false prophet, will be taken alive and thrown into the lake of fire. But there will be remaining peoples across the earth. And these people will enter the millennium. Not all the folks that go into the, the millennium will necessarily be saved as we know being saved today. They will go because uh, the Lord Jesus, after he has conquered these armies that have come against Jerusalem and against him, he will judge the nations. In Matthew 25, you can read about that. He divides the sheep from the goats. To the sh goats, he says, depart into, uh, into everlasting fire, into punishment, so on. But to the sheep, he says, enter the kingdom prepared for you by my Father from the foundation of the world. These people will go because they have believed in him. It may have come late, but they have believed in him, and so they will enter and populate the world after the great army of uh, the great war, Armageddon, has taken place and destroyed the, the evil armies of the world. So I wanted to kind of explain that because uh, it won't be just glorified saints that will be here on this earth. It will be natural people. And in fact, if you read the scriptures, you'll find that, um, uh, that uh, longevity is the norm. When the curse is lifted, when, when uh, the earth gets out from under the curse and begins to become productive as it would if the curse were lifted, and uh, when uh, sickness and disease uh, becomes a, a foreign thing, because Jesus is now here, he's reigning, his influence is worldwide, there's righteousness and peace and prosperity, and uh, thank God there will, be, uh, there will be health and strength such as people have never known before because the curse has been lifted. A summarization of that period then is this. Christ will rule from Jerusalem. All nations will come periodically to worship him and serve him. Righteousness and peace will prevail worldwide and prosperity will be universal. There will be no more war. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 11 verses 6 through 9 says. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling 
together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. That's the very poisonous serpent. Uh, it can even be a cobra. And the, the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den, another very poisonous serpent. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Won't it be wonderful there? Of course, the saints of God who have gone in the rapture will have it even more wonderful than that. Praise the Lord, because they will not be restricted by anything uh, uh, anymore. Praise be to God. All right, so that's, that's kind of a light summary of what will take place during the millennium. But then after the thousand years is finished, the Bible says that Satan is loosed. And the first thing he does is he goes out and begins to deceive the nations. Let me ask you a question. You know, we all, you know, we all long for a utopia. We just would love it, you know. We sometimes visualize, wouldn't it be wonderful just to go to a, a beautiful island in the South Seas and, and just uh, be able to... Uh, relax and in the beautiful surroundings, the blue ocean all around, and eat uh, uh, coconuts and, uh, and mangoes and papaya and um, uh, iced tea and just relax and not be troubled by anything in the world. It would seem that people would be happy for Jesus Christ who is neither Democrat nor Republican, nor Independent, nor Communist, nor Socialist, but He is the way, the truth, and the life, the Holy Son of God, who is altogether good, and who promotes goodness throughout all of His kingdom, prosperity, peace, and righteousness. Let me back up just a little bit and say that he will rule with a rod of iron. This will be imposed righteousness. Nobody can get by with rebellion. No one can disobey and go undisciplined. You know now, sometimes discipline or judgment is, is delayed deferred, but in the time of the millennium, the Bible says if Egypt doesn't come up to Jerusalem to worship at the proper time and to worship the king and uh, uh, observe the Feast of Tabernacles, that they won't get any rain. The discipline comes immediately. Rain is withheld from them. Is this a malicious thing on the part of the Lord? No. It's simply that he, is, he has implemented a righteous reign and people must, uh, uh, must come, must worship him, must serve him. And his goodness then is extended to them in all wonderful forms. So it's an imposed righteousness, but peace will prevail. Let me just emphasize that. Peace, tranquility. Prosperity will prevail. The Lord's blessings will be upon all who serve him and who obey him. But he will rule with a rod of iron. You would think that people would be happy with that. You know, we vote every four years on a president. And every four years, <coughs> we are hoping to get somebody that everybody can be happy with. But that's never going to happen. <laughs> but Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years, and goodness and mercy and grace will prevail upon all of the peoples of the world. And you would think 
that folks would be happy with that. But Satan goes out and succeeds in making people dissatisfied, disgruntled, not happy with the king because of this imposed righteous reign that we are under. He goes out and poisons their minds with the same mindset that he has. He is a liar and the father of it, and his eternal ambition has been to overthrow God and everything having to do with God and impose his own evil regime upon people. But people will be deceived. And the Bible tells us that he goes out, he gathers these, and they, th this, this army mobilizes from the four quarters of the earth and then it says Gog and Magog. It is possibly a reference to the instigators under the devil. But the others answer the call. And it seems, well, in fact, the word says that an army that numbers more than the sands of the sea gathers together and surrounds the camp of the saints and the holy city. <clears throat> thinking to overthrow the righteous rule of the king. But I want you to know that when that army gathers, there's going to be a great fiasco because the Bible says that fire came from heaven and devoured all of those people. But praise God, there's something wonderful that takes place after that. The Bible tells us that Satan is cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. I want you to notice the wording of that. The, the Satan is cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. It has been a thousand years since the beast and the false prophet were thrown into the lake of fire, but the word says that they are still there. They were not consumed, but they're still there, alive in the lake of fire. I believe that this is further proof and further refutes the teaching that when evil men or when the unsaved are cast into the lake of fire, that they will be consumed and they will perish and not be anymore. This scripture tells us a different story where the beast and the false prophet are. Amen. Praise God. An eternal, never dying, horrible existence in the lake of fire. But you know, after that, there will be a final judgment. John said, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Who is that judge? I believe it's the Son of God himself. Because Jesus said that all judgment had been committed by the Father to him. Do you know that Jesus Christ is the only person uh, capable, worthy to judge mankind? Why is that? Because the Word tells us that he was the last Adam. Paul tells us that. He was the last Adam. What do we mean by that? We mean this. Adam, the first Adam, is the father of all of us. But Jesus is the last Adam, and he becomes the, the, the head of a new race, those who believe on him and receive him as their Savior. He is the last Adam. So when we, when we received him, we were gathered up into him. Praise God, we became a part of him. Just as 
uh, in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Praise the Lord. So that's our position. But the Word says that he was, as the last Adam, he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. There's not another human being on the face of the earth that can say that about themselves. There is only one man in the universe who is capable of judging his fellow men, and that is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. That is, I believe that is him who is sitting on the throne, the glorified Son of God. The Word tells us, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Let me pause here for just a moment. These dead are the wicked dead. In fact, in our, pa in our chapter, it tells us that after the, uh, the uh, believers are resurrected and are, are received into heaven, including the martyrs that we talked about and showed the graphic about, it said, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. So these are the ones, the wicked dead, the unsaved dead, the unbelievers, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. Notice that plural, the word books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Praise God. Could I stop here and preach a little sermon? Hallelujah. These will be judged according to their works. There are things in my past that I'm ashamed of. There are things that if God judged me according to my past, I would split hell wide open. But I'm so glad that, that when the last Adam came along and he died on the cross, shedding his blood to cleanse me from all of my sins, I no longer have a history, but I do have a future. Praise God. For here's what the book says about the past of those who repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he removes our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions against us, uh, our transgressions. And the word says that he will never remember them again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One passage says, God says that he cast our sins behind his back. And I'm glad he never turns around. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. What does that mean? Well, Paul said, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. God said to his son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Hell, the Greek word there is Hades. And, it, and uh, before Christ's resurrection and ascension to heaven and the taking of the Old Testament saints from their tombs and into the, pres into the eternal presence, moving paradise uh, from, uh, from uh, the region called Hades, uh, to the presence of the Lord, so uh, uh, into the heaven. So that Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But anyway, that place, that Hades, there were two compartments according to what we understand in the Word of God. The rich man who went to hell could see across a great chasm and he could see Father Abraham and Lazarus being comforted in his bosom. And... and uh, but when Jesus rose from the dead, 
only those people on the other side where Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Lazarus and all of these others were. These are the only ones that were moved from that location to the higher level. The others were still there. That is what will be cast into the lake of fire. That place of the departed evil, the wicked, the unsaved, the unbelievers. Hell delivered up which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Twice it said in that short passage, they were judged according to their works. Let me tell you something. That's going to be a serious day. No matter when, no matter where these people may have died, buried, were buried, how they died, no matter how, uh, if their ashes were scattered o over the ocean, no matter if they were devoured by animals or fish, uh, when God issues his summons to judgment, they'll come. They will come. I remember reading a story of a man. He gave instructions. When I die, I want you to put me in a concrete tomb. I want you to put a big rock in the door and put a chain on it because when God summons to judgment, I'm, I don't plan to go. God didn't have to use a great, big, powerful force. All he did was have a nearby oak tree drop a little acorn down into a crevice between the stone and the tomb. And as the years passed, the tree grew and the stone was burst and rolled away and the tomb was exposed. I tell you, when God says, come to judgment, they'll come. They'll come. Every one of them. Every last one of them. The Bible says the books were opened. The books were opened and another book was opened. And the dead were judged. What are these books? Well, actually, we could put a title on each one of those with the name of an individual and say, this is your life. Did you know that God keeps an accurate record of everything that we do, of our thoughts, of our motives, of everything about us? There is... Actually, God knows more about you than your wife knows. God knows more about you than you know that you consciously know. Christians are not going to stand before this judgment. This is the great white throne judgment. Believers ju will be judged before the throne of the judgment seat of Christ, but that's a different one. And they'll be judged not as to whether they'll go to heaven or hell but judged according to their Christian service, judged according to their obedience to the Lord, and so on and so forth. Paul gives us kind of an example in 2 Corinthians, I believe, uh, when he speaks of, of uh, every man's works will be tried yet as by fire. And then it said, if any man's work abide, then he shall receive a reward. But if a man's, and, and it's said that every man, there's no foundation can be laid but the one that's already laid, and that's Christ. He said, men build on this foundation with wood, hay, stubble, um, gold, silver, precious stones. If any man's work abide, and so on, he will receive a reward. But if it's burned up, he himself will be saved, yet so is by fire. Or like somebody that just barely gets out of the burning building with nothing, absolutely nothing. You know, that in itself is a serious thing to think about. We believers need to think about that. Oh, I have prayed, dear God, please, in spite of my meanness, somehow help me to serve you in such a way that when I stand before you and my works which I have done in the name of Christ, are tested by the fires. Dear Lord, grant that there will be something, something of value left that I can lay at your feet. I, I just shudder when I think 
that there is a possibility of a believer going to the judgment seat of Christ and all of his works, her works, burned up because what they did was not for the glory of God, but for self-advancement or of self-satisfaction or whatever. Ah, oh, friends, I, I don't want to be like that person who wrote the song, uh, if I can just make it in. Oh, I don't want to just make it in. I want to make it in with something that I can present to the king and say, Lord, I am not worthy of this crown. I'm not worthy of this reward. I want to lay it at your feet because you have done everything for me that uh, is worth mentioning. My goodness, I could preach a little if I stayed right there. I believe I'll move on here. Praise God. The unsaved will be at that white throne judgment, and the, that judgment will expose every detail of their lives. Listen to the serious word of Paul in Romans 2.16. God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Then there was the book. This is the book of life. God brings all of the evidence to the court so that everyone may see that he's the righteous judge. The unsaved will no doubt, when the, I don't know if the Lord himself will look through the book or if he'll have an angel to scan the book, to look for your name. But if someone standing there hears the words, your name is not in this book, I believe they'll know in their heart why their name's not there. I believe they'll know it's because they rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, who, the only means of salvation and eternal life. Jesus said the Holy Spirit, when He came, would convict or convince or reprove the world of sin because they believe not on Me. Brothers and sisters, that is the cardinal sin tonight. That is the worst of sins. Can I just back up and say, that's the only sin that will send men to hell, is the refusal to accept Christ Jesus as Savior of their souls. <coughs> well, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire, the Bible tells us. Praise the Lord. Those whose names are not written in the book of life were also cast into the lake of fire. What a terrifying conclusion to this chapter. That's the last word in the chapter 20 tonight. And you visualize thousands and thousands of people plunging into the roaring flames of a pit of fire. It's a sickening sight. It's t it tears at your heart. And adding to the horror is the realization that they are not consumed. If so, that would be a mercy in itself if God just simply consumed them. But theirs is a never-dying, but all-ever-dying torment, an eternal home in the lake of fire. That is the destiny of the unsaved. That is the second death. But you know something? Within the body of this chapter, we've seen the future of the saved. Praise God. First there's rapture. Glory to God. Then rewards. Then the marriage supper of the Lamb. Praise be to God. Then the return to earth to reign with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the word says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him. A thousand years. But that's not all. The next two chapters 
unfold an eternal future for the saints of God, which is beyond human comprehension. That can be your future. You don't want to miss it. That's right. Praise be to God. Is your name written there in that book? There's only one way to have it, and that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that everyone in this house professes salvation. I will not judge your heart, but let me just give you a scripture tonight. If there is any doubt whatsoever in your mind or heart, that if thou shalt confess yes. the Lord Jesus with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, or to right standing in the sight of God. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I'll see you in the rapture. Praise the Lord. Pastor. I'll see you in the rapture. I'll see you in the rapture. I'll see you at that meeting in the air. There with our blessed Savior will live and reign forever. I'll see you in the rapture some sweet day. How many of you going? Those other promises, they're fulfillment of God's word, but they're not to the promise to the saints of God. That promise of that rapture, that's what I'm claiming. Hallelujah. You going in the rapture of Jesus Christ, would you stand to your feet? Would you begin to praise Him as we sing this song and celebrate the fact that God is a covenant God and He's faithful to His Word? To my loved ones let me say that there'll surely come a day when the Lord will call you home and He'll take His bride away. So get ready now to meet Him and with hallelujah greet Him. I'll see you in the rapture some sweet day. I'll see you in the rapture. I'll see you in the rapture. I'll see you at that meeting in the air. There with our blessed Savior, we'll live and reign forever. I'll see you in the rapture some sweet day. Lord, I just thank you for the promises in your holy word. We know that heaven and earth is going to pass away, but your word is going to abide forever. You have documented down through eons of times the time that you have purged and cleansed man and this earth. And I thank you that there's going to be an eternity forever and forever. And for the saints of God who have read the book and made a covenant with you, we're going to inherit the promises of the blessings of God. I have not seen or earth heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But he's made it known to us through his word tonight. I thank you, Lord, that you're a rewarder to the saints of God. Help us, O oh God, with compassion. Wake us up in our sleep, Lord, to show us a neighbor that's lost and not ready, that's counting on the White House and counting on the system of this world and the system of the Antichrist. Lord, we know they're void and vain, but I hold to the covenant of God. You're the author and the finisher of our faith, and I believe you for the promises of God in Jesus' wonderful name. How many are going to claim the promises of God? How would you like to see an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival where saints could come and sense the presence of God and the sinners could come down the aisle? I'm just looking forward, Brother Long, to preaching and having right at the close of the service the whole thing interrupted by somebody getting up and crying and run down to the front. 
Hallelujah. I, had to, I lost my train of thought. I had to go back to point number one. <laughs> Woo! And I went down and prayed for them, and I got saved, and their names were written down the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Well, Brother Long is going to be preaching for us this coming next Wednesday night. We want to encourage you to come and participate at the practice of the marriage supper of the Lamb. But until then, uh, Brother Long is going to invoke God's promises and blessings upon His church, His body, that we become the saints of God and soul winners in Jesus' precious name. Father, we're so thankful for Your Word tonight that has been brought to our hearing. May we take every word and apply it to our hearts and our lives and challenge us to be able to warn those round about us. Father, I pray that you'd lay your hand of mercy upon us and keep us safe in your care. Bring us back the next time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tell Brother and Sister Walls how much you enjoyed that message.